All right, here we are. Welcome back to the second episode of the Wavecast. Hi. <laughs> What's going on lately, Will? What have you been reading? Anything stick out? What do you got for the uh, well, podcast this week? I was talking about it last week. I was starting The Power of Now. I finished it. Very nice. I found it to be quite good. I think uh, in the first chapter, you pretty much get the entire description of what Eckhart Tolle is talking about. And then he goes on for another, I think, nine chapters, just further explaining the context of what it is to be in the moment, appreciating the now, conscious of your thoughts and emotions and acting in the most beneficial capacity instead of just being this kind of carefree in individual who's talking about the power of now it's more of a well no you still exist and you need to do what needs to be done but you don't need to put such emotional weight to it or logical fallacies that will lead to disappointment yeah I a think, few examples of those fallacies you're talking about to give us a good idea of it honestly i don't know so I think what a lot of people do when uh, they're engaging in interactions with uh, the world and people, they they have this story that they tell themselves when people react to them or react to their environment. And the story that's going on in their head tends to uh, be pretty defeating. So someone has been upset by something you've done and they're freaking out at you. The thing that you've done was in your best intentions but it didn't work out and you're given a choice and the power now says you can either react and let your ego take over and you can be offended and hurt or you can accept the present moment and act in a way that is beneficial to all parties and, and moves you forward whereas when you're not using this notion of the power of now and you're thinking about how this person is making you feel and how you don't deserve to feel this way or you're not uh, worthy of acting properly. People will get stuck in the, these mind patterns that are very destructive and, and they just react to the reaction. And what happens is you just get this terrible circle of reaction, 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 destruction. But with the power of now, it says, look, you're in a, spot and you need to get it out of that spot and no matter how upset you are that you're in that spot your emotions aren't going to help you what you're thinking about how things could have gone or things might go that's irrelevant you need to assess the moment you need to analyze it pragmatically i think would be a good word and, and just do what is required instead of getting caught up in emotional quagmire there's a lot there yeah it's it, there's a lot to it and there's there's nothing to it because uh, yeah. i think once you you can get to the point where and we were talking about this earlier there's knowledge and there's intelligence and those are two separate things and and once you know what it is that's happening in your brain that the the ego is constantly assessing and filtering the world and it's filtering it through its own special lens and it's saying I like this, I don't like that, I'm pleased with this, I'm not pleased with that. When you step past that and you say, well, that doesn't really matter what needs to be done, um, it's very freeing. Yeah, like discipline equals freedom. Yeah, kinda, Jocko talks about that. You kind of form your own habits and you stick to it, and you remain, you remain disciplined to it, then that leaves you to be free for whatever else you want or need to do. Mm -hmm. And it ties in interesting with the, interestingly with this other book I'm reading, which we were talking about, The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. And I think, like I said, with knowledge, you need to be aware of how your brain works because we're not all the same. We're all equal, but we're definitely equal in different capacities. And The Four Tendencies talk about uh, how individuals with one of these tendencies react to internal expectations and external expectations and when you know 
what type of tendency you have, whether that's upholder, questioner, obliger, or rebel, you can sort of brace yourself for how social interactions and expectations come in and sort of be aware and, and run your own story in spite of what is being asked you if the person wording it is, is not doing very well you can see through their sort of surface level communication and, and understand what their higher intention is and, and know that you know everyone has a good intention and they start with that good intention and then it works through their brain and comes out of their mouth as this vomit of attempt at communication and maybe they offend you in their wording but their intent isn't to offend you that that's definitely never a person's intent it, it, it's not to offend even if it is their stated intent it, it's got a much deeper meaning at a subconscious level whether it's defending their values or the perception of themselves or preserving their life situation something that Eckhart Tolle talks about a lot is you have your life situation and then you have your life and your life is good and you may not be satisfied with where you are in your life situation and that may put you in a place where you're more likely to be humiliated by certain expectations that are coming in but when you are aware of that you can set that thought pattern aside and just try and do the best you can and you know cut some slack for people's communication methods and be the one who is the brighter light instead of slipping into the unconscious tendency to just react and defend your position and defend your honor. You know, you can sort of understand where the person's coming from and be able to, in your own mind, work it so that it does benefit you and you're able to get the point across and, and let their point come through to you without swatting it out of your perception yeah that's a skill that i think a lot of people need more practice in just overall communication being precise in your speech and deciphering other people's speech more efficiently absolutely a, a lot of people uh, myself especially you know it's it's hard you, you you do the whole mind reading thing you, someone says something and that means something to you and you think that's what they're trying to say i think um, technology has been awful for that, especially with our generation growing up on MSN Messenger and Facebook Messenger and SMS messaging systems. You know, you, you have the tendency to read what someone says in the voice of your own uh, filter and not take into account what they actually mean by their words. And you start making these assumptions that just ruin the interaction. Yeah, that's a big part of it, too. We're reducing all of these deep conversations to just symbols on a page that we interpret in our own ways. And we don't understand how differently those interpretations are from each other. I think that's the biggest thing. Yeah. And what about yourself? What, what, uh, what's going on in your world? What have you been reading? What are you thinking about? Well, reading, I'm on a Neil Gaiman kick, as I've been saying. Been deep in the the Sandman universe. Well, not the universe, but the, the series. The, the, yeah. the regular series. Sandman universe is another title in itself, so I don't want to get <laughs> anybody confused. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, Neil, Neil Gaiman is definitely on my top list of things to read right now. And why would you say it is in your top list? What's prioritized that lately? What's going on with that? Well, I've been getting into writing lately, so Neil Gaiman's been like one of my top tier inspirations for the stuff that I've been getting into just because he's into a lot of the stuff that I like to research on my own, like mythology and you know all these postmodern kind of ideas about death and dreams. And his family called the Endless are just incredible characters in my mind. I think they're flawless. Okay. I think it could I think it could sprout a whole religion in itself. I just really? love the, I love the way that he constructs the the reality of the dreamscape that he has called the dreaming. It's it's really hard to describe to someone like why it's so good until they've read it. It's like describing Shakespeare to someone. It it's hard to describe. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. It's it's uh 
a unique creation. Yeah. Like, it's hard to compare to other comic books because when I read it, it's like, it reads like a Neil Gaiman novel. Like, it's, when I'm reading Neil Gaiman, it's not like I'm reading a, another book or reading another comic book. It's, it's the experience that this guy wants to give to me. And it, it's the same in any medium. And that's interesting. So his capacity for storytelling is, um, it shifts seamlessly through the medium. Yeah, and I could compare that to um, another book that I read recently called Here There Be Dragons by a guy named James A. Owen, I think his name. I think I've heard of that book. Yeah, James Owen. James A. Owen. And when I read that book, I think this, this reads like a comic. This, this would almost fit better as a comic book. And then I look him up, and sure enough, he's best known for uh, a comic series called called star child if i'm not mistaken oh yeah yeah star child the chronicles of the imaginarium geographica novel series yeah that's the those are the books that i've been kind of getting into they're like just children's fantasy novels but i enjoy that kind of stuff fair enough got a the series has a really neat concept to it too because it's got like a the three main characters are meant to represent three of the Inklings. Like, it's J.R.R. Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, and uh, Charles something. I forget. But his character's name is Charles. They're called, like, just Charles, John, and Jack. It doesn't reveal that they're representations of these characters until the end, but you can pretty much pick up on it right away. It's a pretty, <laughs> pretty fun writing style that he has, but... It really feels like it's a comic book writer that wrote that book. When I read a book by Neil Gaiman, it's just another incredible book by Neil Gaiman or another incredible experience by Neil Gaiman. Right. And the art's really good. The storytelling is just flawless. I recently read a story in Sandman called A Game of You, and it's, it's surprisingly relevant for today's political climate. So oh, think, really? Yeah, last week we were... Uh, talking a little bit about Sandman and about the series that they're coming out with. And uh, that, that um, little story arc, A Game of You, I think they could make into a Netflix original pretty easily. But there is some of the other stuff that's kind of questionable. I don't know if it would translate well to television. But I need to get on, I need to get on some of Neil Gaiman's other shows that he's been producing too. Oh, like uh, the American Gods one? Yeah, I need to watch that, and I need to watch Good Omens. I just bought that book the other day, too. That's his, too, eh? Yeah, it's him and Terry Pratchett. As if. I was watching an yeah, interview. I... I was watching an interview with uh, uh, Neil Gaiman and Tim Ferriss, and it was really good. And they were talking about Good Omens a little bit. It's, and that's like, what is that, almost 30 years old, the, the book Good Omens, right? Like, it, they started it a long time ago. and. Mm -hmm. It, it was released kind of, not recently, but recent enough. Well, the TV series just came out this year. Yeah. But Terry Pratchett just recently died, so that was like a thing that they were trying to work on before. Like the show, I guess, was something they were trying to work on before he died, but... Right. I'll have to check it out. I haven't, like, I keep seeing it come up, but I, I haven't clicked it yet. I just watched The Umbrella Academy on Netflix. That was really fun. Okay. Some of my friends have been telling me to watch it. I was surprisingly satisfied with it. It was uh -huh. like it's it's coming on the heels of this comic book movie phenomenon that Marvel has been just pushing for the past 10 years, right? <laughs> yeah. So so it's like, oh great, another show about superheroes, but this time it's by DC cuz DC wants to cash in and it it was really good. Um, I hate what's her name and plays Vanya, the main character, Ellen Page. I absolutely despise her acting. <laughs> I don't even think it's anything to do with her ability. I'm sure that she's got a great ability uh, uh, started with a lovely talent, but she just plays this meek girl child woman in everything I've ever seen her in. And it's just like, I don't think I've ever seen her in a role where she's just happy. Hmm. And she's sort of the outcast 
in this show, but she's the main character, which makes you right away think, okay, something's obviously going to happen where she goes center stage. And like I said, I just finished the season last night and they're approved for a second season. So it'll be interesting to see where it goes, but gosh, darn it. It was like nails on chalkboard watching her act as this (laughs) character that is just like an outcast and depressed and plays the violin, but it was really good. And the plot, carried me through nice i might get into the comics or something if my if i get interested enough it's the um it's a dark horse comic okay i lied it's not dc is it dc no it's just dark horse dark horse dark horse is pretty good it's one of yeah i love dark horse they put out a lot of good cereals that i've really enjoyed so i uh just got back from the bookstore bought a few books what'd you get uh Dubliners by James Joyce, The Time Machine and Other Stories by H.G. Wells, and The Lovecraft Compendium. So, what is The Lovecraft Compendium? Uh, It's got a couple... Yeah, it includes Dagon, The Call of Cthulhu, The Dunwich Horror, The Whisperer in Darkness, and The Haunter of the Dark. Because I picked up the next Necronomicon last year by Lovecraft, which is like huge, right? Necronomicon is featured in so many things across so many mediums, and mm. I love it. I'm I'm only a few short stories in, but like it, it's like you have all of these different stories and perspectives in this universe that is united through this common thread that Lovecraft's created, and it's yeah. it's fascinating. Yeah, I just love how it's almost like a comic universe before comics became like what they are today. But he he got his like crew together and he's like, "Okay, I created this Cthulhu mythos. Feel free to write your own stories within it and we'll just combine them all together and we'll create the Cthulhu mythos together." And I guess it wasn't just H.P. Lovecraft, it was him plus all of his friends that he wanted to write in the same universe. Yeah. And a lot of good horror came out of it. Yeah, like he's like the godfather of modern sci-fi. Yeah. Like, he created a new genre, really. Like, if you're describing someone, you, you say, like, they have a Lovecraftian edge to them. Like, I could say Neil Gaiman has a Lovecraftian edge to him. Mm-hmm. He's responsible for inspiring so many people. Oh, yeah. And you, you got the time machine, eh? I, I just rewatched the time machine a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. That's a great movie. I don't know how awesome the book is. Probably logarithmically better. We should uh, put this one on the list of stuff to do in the book wave. Yeah, I'm up for that. I really want to get to Island by Aldous Huxley. We were talking about yeah. that earlier. Yeah, there's, there's too many books to plan out. There's too many. Yeah. <laughs> We're so close to starting Dante's Divine Comedy. Yeah. I just need to get my butt in gear and read some more Atlas Shrugged. (laughs) Seriously, you are slacking. For once, it's not me. Yeah, I finished chapter two, but I need to keep going. Need to keep keep going. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it's it's a commitment. Like, it's a small font, and there's no margins. Like, it's probably two hours, maybe four hours per chapter. Just reading. And this uh, H.G. Wells book has uh, quite a few other short stories in it, too. Got The Empire of Ants, The Cone, The Lord of the Dynamos, The Country of the Blind, The Stolen Basilisk. Ba- basilisk? I don't know how to pronounce that. Like from Harry Potter? Like a basilisk? It's, a, it's B-A-C-I-L-L-U-S. B-A-C-I-L-L-U-S? Yeah, The Stolen Basilisk. That one's only like uh, nine or ten pages long. Hey, it's Batman. Hey, Batman. Yo. How's it going, brother? Doing all right. That's good Doing to right. hear. Here, let's take What's... a let's take a little break for a little mid roll break, and then we'll be back. All right, welcome back. How's it going, Patman? What you been reading lately? Just the same books that I mentioned last week. Yeah. Lucifer Effect and uh, 
you have the right to remain in. And you made much progress on those? How's, how are those books unfolding? Well, I'm learning a lot more about the results of the Stanford Prison Experiment in the Lucifer Effect and how each of the students who played as prisoners and guards, uh, how they were greatly affected by the experiment after six days. And Dr. Simbardo mentions three different personality scales that were used to experiment. One of them is, I think it's called the fossil scale. The other one is a Machiavellian scale, which you can pretty much guess what the Machiavellian scale is. And there was another one in there that I forgot what it was, but essentially the experiment was testing the masculinity, the openness, the extroversion, the introversion of each student during the experiment. Who was weakest, who was the strongest. And it was pretty interesting to to, know, to actually read through it because in the book, Zimbardo mentions one of the guards named Hellman, and he was, he was known to be the most brutal guard during that experiment. And throughout the six days of the experiment, he pretty much had low testosterone. Even though he was shown to be tough, and and then there was another study mentioned that uh, one of the prisoners who did not bail out of the experiment had the highest form of masculinity, had the highest form of testosterone during that experiment, even though he went through hell and back right, before, right when the experiment ends. Each scale just, it's kind of like the big five personality scale. It, it just showed who had the highest and who had the lowest traits as far as extroversion, openness, masculinity, strength, uh, willpower. And it, it was pretty interesting to look at that. So these were like hugely determining factors in, in uh, let's call it survivability in the experiment then? Yeah, essentially. Hmm. And so the more extroverted did better and the more introverted did worse? From what I've read, yes, that was the case. Hmm. That's interesting. I guess that makes more sense. Like the introvert would be more likely to internalize all of that struggle rather than, you know, share it with someone, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, and, and also another thing that really tested their mentality, the prisoner's mentality, is when they had visitors, their, their family, their friends, girlfriends visit them, and then some of the guards were just hounding the visitors very bluntly and everything. Just kind of embarrassing or making things awkward around the visitors and the prisoners. That kind of tested their mentality. Hmm. That's how I've read so. Yeah, I was just telling Scott I finished The Power of Now this week and started The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. Just kind of... Yeah, what, what was that book about? Power of Now? Yeah. What was that like? That was, it was good. It was um, a, a spiritual lesson in enlightenment, I think would be the way I'd summarize it. Eckhart Tolle propounds his theory on uh, thoughtfulness and mindfulness and superseding the ego state of liking and disliking the environment and just truly witnessing the world and your moment to moment experience. And really hammers down the fact that there's nothing you can do in the future and there's nothing you can do to change the past. All you have is right now, forever and ever and ever. And the only time to make change and to get over internal issues is to accept that they are simply a symptom of the ego creating uh, thought patterns to keep you in a state of trying to please your ego instead of live in your own bliss and self of higher realization. I think one of the coolest parts that uh, really caught my eye was he, he talks a lot about God, um, but not so much that it's off-putting. And he talks about how when Adam and Eve ate the fruit of forbidden knowledge, they were kicked out of paradise. And I think it's interesting because the way he explains it, it's not the action of eating the fruit 
that was what got them kicked out of paradise, but that when they ate the fruit, they were given the ability to notice good and evil. And that's what removed them from paradise, that they became conscious of these egoic thought patterns that said this is good and this is evil. That's what stripped them of paradise. Not that it was this physical place they were kicked out of, but that when we witness actions and events and circumstance as good or evil, that that is the egoic brain filtering the world and identifying or disidentifying with certain things it likes or dislikes. And that's when we're not in paradise. And when we stop our ego and we stop that constant stream of thoughts that say, I should have done this, I should have, do, should have done that. I need to do this. I need to do that. I don't like this. I don't like that. When we shut that down and we say, I am the thinker, I am the observer of the thinker, moreover, um, that we can be in that state of paradise, that heaven can be on earth when we say, I'm not my ego, I'm not my mind, I'm not my body, I'm not the pain I experience, I'm beyond that, I am the passenger, and these are symptoms of the ego and the body, and they don't define me. I define me. Yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. Yeah, it hit me really hard. I, I really liked it. It was like, because I've, I watched, um, who is it? Joseph Smith? Does he have the uh, hero with the thousand faces? Am I getting his jo name wrong? Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell. Um, so I watched his interviews on the uh, Netflix there. Yeah. And he, t <laughs> <laughs> he talks about um, how the Bible was this really good book of prose. And... And when I heard that, I was like, yeah, okay, I agree. But then when Eckhart Tolle said, look, the knowledge of good and evil is what removes us from paradise. The way he worded it just kind of really resonated with me. I was like, oh, okay. So when we really attach ourselves to our opinions of things, that's, that's when we stop living. That's when we start psychologically breaking down our own state of joy and bliss. Yeah, it's almost like a parallel to the ignorance equals bliss kind of thing but you kind of yeah. just have to change your mindset in a way that like by default we just assume that good and evil exists but like is that a construct or is it a spectrum or what what is it really when we talk about good and evil well we exactly we can't really touch it we can't define it very well we could say like the abuse of children is evil objectively evil but but then you you have abused children who go out and because of their abuse they do incredible things yeah, and they, so they, they become the one percent they become the heroes of our society the instant you take your timeline and you expand it your constructs break down and you need to shift how you perceive these events of impacting humanity like something that seems really really bad or conversely really really good can have the opposite impact, something that we've been talking about a lot, right? Like we don't have the perception to know what is good and evil, but when we identify with what we think is good and evil, especially now with this whole liberal conservative split, right? Like saying, oh, that's the wrong way to do it. This is the right way to do it. It's like, well, are you sure? Do you have the perspective? Do you see the whole picture? And yeah. like, there's things morally that we can object to, and I would urge you to have a moral compass, but also that grain of salt needs to be carried with you that, you know, you need to have reasonable doubt and, and be able to, to think about things a bit bigger than that moment where you're sort of saying, no, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, when it, it could be this small minor thing that is holding up your entire life and stopping you from achieving greatness yeah i like to think of it like every action has an equal and opposite reaction so every time you have something really bad happen in your life maybe next week you're gonna have something equally good happen or the equal good is gonna be dispersed later on well it's like i was reading kind of like um, a loose karma i was reading the hope quotient by pastor ray johnston and that was way too religious for me. It was really hard to get through, but it still had some good points. And one of the points he makes is that we aren't put on this planet to 
not be able to deal with anything that comes our way. Everything that comes our way, we have inside us the ability to deal with. And I think um, a lot of the Stoics that we were reading talk about the same thing, that there's nothing in this universe that you're confronted with that you don't have inside you that's bigger than you, that you can't conquer. And, and that all of these trials and tribulations and things like that are meant to build you into this greater version of yourself. But when we say, oh, well, this is making me suffer, and then we choose to identify with the fact that we're suffering and that we don't deserve to suffer and that we say, oh, well, life shouldn't be suffering. It's, it's when we attach ourselves to suffering that we stop existing. And that was the other thing, too, that Eckhart Tolle talks about. He says, like, a lot of Catholics, they identify with their suffering and they say that their suffering is what brought them to God. And he would argue the very opposite. He would say, no, you bring yourself to God and you chose to bring yourself to, or enlightenment, however you want to perceive that term, right? Um, when you choose to stop suffering and accept the power of now or God or enlightenment, that's just the choice that you've made that allows you to do that. And when you stop bearing your suffering, it's not because you suffered that you got there. It's that you chose to stop suffering and you can choose to start suffering at any point on your journey, or you could attempt in fact to avoid it altogether and say, no, this is just life. And I'm going to be me at, at every point on the curve and not identify with my suffering and not blame the world for my problems. I'm just going to do the best I can. Yeah, and take a moment every once in a while to just breathe. Watch yourself breathe. Yeah, breath control is so key. I was going to say that just taking a minute to breathe, that's, what, um, that's the quote that kind of echoed throughout my days because I'm currently going through some life changes right now. And just knowing that I can take a minute and just look at the task that I have at hand and say, this is going to be the same thing as breathing. I will put one finger on the keyboard and then the other on the other side of the keyboard when I'm writing, and I'll just treat it like breathing. Uh, I can treat it that way. I can treat it the same way when I try out uh, different foods, uh, try out this new diet that I'm on, and just taking a few seconds to actually take in all the flavors and paying attention to how my body reacts to it, I know that that's going to clear my head a little bit because of, from all the other distractions that, I've, that I have. And knowing that everything that has been cluttered in my mind is completely evaporated. It's interesting that you mentioned that mindfully eating because I don't know who where I got this quote, maybe it was one of the stoic quotes that I get every day, but it, it had to do with the, the idea that whoever eats their meal quickest uh, lives the least. And so the idea is, and I've, I've been reading about it a lot, it, when you actually take the time to chew your food, um, that's when digestion starts, because the stomach doesn't have teeth. And when you enjoy your food and chew your food and, and mindfully eat your meal and experience it that you're helping yourself um, in many ways first of all you're living you're enjoying and you're not having such a hard time digesting it later because the less you chew the harder your stomach has to work the more chemicals it has to pump in to break down that food and I think that that's something that a lot of people don't make time for anymore it's actually enjoying their food you know like we have a job and we have responsibilities and food is so very much just a means to an end and this sort of fuel and people understand that, look, you need to eat to live, but no one really lives to eat anymore. And I'm not saying you need to spend all your time eating slowly, but you should definitely slow it down and experience your meal because you only get so many of them and your stomach will definitely thank you in the long run. And so will your mind. Yeah, and cooking is a great hobby to pick up, too. Absolutely. I love cooking, although I've been slacking lately. I've gotten this Instant Pot, and Instant Pot cooking is the easiest way to cook in the world. My goodness, you just throw yeah. everything in and turn it on and walk away, and in an hour, food's ready. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I pretty much eat the same thing every day, but 
You really should learn to enjoy what you're eating and not just treat it as a chore. I know when uh, David Goggins has this one quote where he's like, when people ask him, why do you run if you hate it? And he says, well, I hate eating and showering too, but I still do that. <laughs> oh my God. Like you got, you got to take those little victories when you can. I actually saw someone yesterday with a shirt that uh, jogging or running takes only as much as it gives. Mm. I think a lot of people shy away from running and jogging and physical exercise altogether because they see it as this daunting task and they forget about just how beneficial it is. Yeah. It reminds, it reminds me of a, a quote that Haruki Murakami stumbled when he was uh, training for a marathon. He's a novelist and he always trains for trains to run and he wrote a memoir and he stumbled upon a quote outside of a gym somewhere. And I think it might've been when he was going to train for the Boston marathon or somewhere else. And the quote said, and I'm just paraphrasing. It's easy to gain weight than it is to lose it. It's hard to gain muscle than it is to gain weight or, or something like that. And it's just, just a moment of like a slap to the face. Like this is going to, this is something that's part of life. You can either take the hard path and train yourself for days to lose weight or gain weight, gain muscle, or you could just sit back, watch life go by, enjoy all the, all the sweets and all the other fatty foods, which can be, you know, really easy to get. But in the medium to long term run, it's going to greatly affect you. I think people could do with more mind over matter as well. I know, like, because some people have the hardest time eating breakfast. I don't know if you guys struggle with eating breakfast, but I, I came across this discovery when I decided, you know, I need to eat breakfast every day because, as the old adage says, it's the most important meal of the day. And you wake up in the morning and you're not hungry. But people, often think okay eating means putting it into my stomach but when you take a bite and you chew it and you chew it and you chew it it's really easy to eat and no one even takes that first bite they just say oh i'm not hungry and they go and they have their coffee and they go their day but when you put aside the 20 minutes it takes to make and eat a meal and you just say look i'm gonna eat even though my body doesn't think i'm hungry I am smarter than my body and I know I'm hungry so it's time to eat and I'm going to start with this bite and I'm going to chew it and then when I'm done chewing it I'm going to swallow it and nothing bad is going to happen and in fact I will feel better and I will work harder and I will last longer and it, it doesn't happen that often you know I see a lot of people they're just saying well I'm not hungry and they just go and it's like well you should probably eat a meal and you probably have control over your body enough to the point that you could feed yourself. And imagine if you could feed yourself breakfast every morning, just how many other things you could control. Yeah. It works for some people. I prefer fasting. That's, that's another form of discipline, I guess. I never eat breakfast. Fasting helps. You yeah. never eat breakfast? Never. I eat at oh. noon. That's my breakfast. I break my fast at noon. And then I have another meal around dinner time. That's about it. So you don't even do like a fruit smoothie in the morning? No, I barely eat fruit. Got that IBS. What about like a, a vegetable smoothie? Doesn't really benefit. Protein bar? No, protein bars are terrible. I can't digest yeah. them. I find, I find it helps just to eat high fat, pick a little six hour window in the day, eat within that time, and then... The rest of the time, you're fine. I, I, I find that it slows down my cognition when I eat, like, outside of that window. So I've narrowed myself down to about, like, six or eight hours, depending on the day. Hmm. I have been doing some intermittent fasting lately, where I would just eat a big meal, sometime around mid-morning or around noon, and then I don't eat anything for the rest of the day until the next day. Yeah. And... And I've noticed some muscle growth on me. And there were times where I didn't really feel hungry. I can go ahead and 
go throughout the rest of the day without eating and I would feel fine. Yeah. I would feel a lot of energy and I could get things done a lot quickly, a lot quickly. Yeah. But I find that like do, when I'm fasting in the morning, I just drink like a bottle of water or so. And that's pretty much all I need to keep myself completely fine until I get hungry around noon. But I eat a lot of like high fat ketogenic kind of diet. So you kind of have to watch what you eat when you're doing the intermittent fasting. Yeah. And also drinking water after a meal uh, also helps with your digestive system. Yeah. Absolutely. But I do need, I do need to eat. I do need to eat more uh, breakfast. There were days where I would just maybe every two or three days I would skip it. Yeah, like if you're having like peanut butter sandwiches and stuff and just bread and potatoes and all kinds of carbs, then uh, you probably want to have breakfast in the morning because you, you start to crash when you run out of energy. But when you're running on fats, it just kind of slowly rolls over till the next time you have to eat. You just keep burning fat. Yeah, you've got a, a whole different diet than the majority, I'd say. The whole fat and protein diet of, of ketogenic. Mm -hmm. I, I applaud you on that. Do you drink any keto coffees? No, I just drink uh, herbal tea sometimes. No sugar. Have you tried? No sugar. Have you tried no the keto coffee? No, I don't like coffee. I've heard I it's good, though. I love the keto coffee. I was, I was doing the keto coffees for a couple months, starting my morning just with a keto coffee, and then uh, going until, like, 12 or 1, and then having a whole bunch of vegetables, like, two pounds of fucking vegetables. Yeah, I'm, I'm just in a unique situation because there's a lot of stuff that bothers me that people would be like, that doesn't make any sense. Eat your bananas. I have a reaction to bananas. I can't eat bananas. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's that's fair enough. Everybody's different. Yeah. I mean, it's probably all my fault from eating a bunch of garbage in my youth, but whatever. I got to figure it all out now. <laughs> yeah. So what kind of other, like, diet specifics are you dealing with, Pat, man? What kind of food are you eating? I'm trying out a Mediterranean diet. Hmm. And right now I'm just... I like to increase my calorie intake and start working out more. Yeah, mostly just uh, I've been trying out Greek salad and bean salad, and it turns out it's really good if you have the, if you have the right ingredients. I like mm -hmm. to start doing that more sometime in the next, next two months, during the next two months, I would say. And then just, uh, just start doing more cardio and calisthenics. Nice. In fact, um, when I've been reflecting on making some life changes, I decided to get myself a bullet journal and try it out. Because back recently, I would just take a, a normal notebook and just write down whatever. But then I found myself to just kind of forget about it or just look at it and feel kind of, I would it would feel daunting. I don't know if it's because of the, the style of the notebook or if it's just the rules that are implied to keeping a bullet journal. But I decided to give it a shot. And in the past couple of days since I've had it, I started putting together everything. And, and, and of course, it, it takes a while. It's, it's going to take some time to get used to it. But lately, I've found myself wanting to put charts in a note in the bullet chart like a uh like a calorie chart a supplement chart when i have to take some supplement pills i would put in affirmations i would put in daily tasks that i need to complete in the next two months things that i would collections that i would like to explore a little bit and and I just realized how much time had passed when I was just filling it out. It felt like I was just writing down everything for like 15 minutes, but then I realized that 45 minutes had passed. It was fascinating. Nice. Hey, we were talking about the four, ten the four tendencies a little while ago. And uh, myself as an obliger, I felt that uh, writing myself like to-do notes like, 
little notes to myself saying, hey, do this, do that. And it's helped me a lot just because, not just as a reminder, but it feels like once it's down on a sticky note, it's like an authoritative force trying to get me to do something. Yeah, and, and also Jordan Peterson mentions this before. Like, you cannot treat a task like it's an authoritarian figure. You can't treat a Google calendar like a tyrant. You have to, you have to pick out the days that you want to do tasks, and you also have to pay attention to patterns as well. That's the thing. Um, you have to find some part of your day where you would want to do a task and pay attention to your reaction. The same way you want to kick an addiction as well. Like if you're spending three hours a day browsing the internet, you have to ask yourself, okay, how can I reduce this in the next week or two? Can I reduce this to two hours and 55 minutes? Try that out. You can't just go cold turkey and expect greater results. You have to chew off each piece one by one. Yeah, take your time chewing. It goes back to the same thing we were talking about before. <laughs> Chew your meat. Exactly. Um, you should check out that Gretchen Rubin quiz on the four tendencies to see where your tendency sits. Because, like, I, I, I agree with you. The, the bullet journals are pretty cool. Um, but, like, you were talking about um, getting intimidated at times by calendars and whatnot. It may give you some insight to see what uh, your tendency is and, and how you react to the, those sort of internal and external expectations of yourself. I, I've had the hardest time well, I guess, being consistent with journaling, man. Well, I guess one tendency that I've noticed is that I was being too hard on myself. That's probably one tendency. And not spending time just providing positive feedback. Because positivity can be a little wishy-washy at times, but... It can give you a kick sometimes, like listening to a five-minute motivational, and that'll make you want to do push-ups or, or whatnot. So I guess that's one thing. Yeah, listening to a, an Akira the Dawn song on YouTube. <laughs> Get y'all fired up. Yeah. One thing I really like to do, because um, in the morning I'll, I'll start reading and I'll start to feel tired, and so I got this app called Insight Timer. And I just try and find a little energizing meditation that's like five minutes long that's just mostly breath control with some affirmations. And it's just immediately changes that state of tired into this state of continuing and being motivated. And I found that to be just so fanta fantastic. Because, yeah, like you said, being happy and, and inspired, it, it's not required for doing. You don't need to be in any emotional state to, to do but being in a positive and empowered state makes doing easier. And that whole state shifting mentality of, of doing a quick meditation or yoga, but the quickest fix, right? Like I don't want to spend two hours trying to get my mind right when I could be spending five minutes shifting my state of mind and then an hour and 55 minutes doing what I've been trying to do. Yeah. And just knowing that peace doesn't come from any external source and from within and you have the choice you have all the power you need to change the way you think i wouldn't agree with that necessarily i think that some people are pretty fucked up <laughs> and you, you know like sure in a world where we train mindfulness at kindergarten everybody would have the power to, to change and in a world where we train mindfulness in kindergarten, maybe everybody could do yoga, everybody could meditate, everybody could do a mindfulness meditation and, and shift their perspective. But many people are sufferers of crippling anxiety and depression, and, and you need to be able to clear that crap off the top before you can even dive into the ocean that is mindfulness. And yeah, it can true. it can really help, you know, working with a therapist or a life coach or a psychologist or a psychiatrist or or uh, a, a coach or a friend that can get you out of your shell and say, look, you, you are enough. But, you know, many times you need an external person to say, and if you're listening, let me be the one to say it. You are enough. You've done a great job. You're capable of more. You can keep going. Beautiful. And... That's why I uh, 
that's why I love hypnosis so much. I, I love the, the notion that you can use this powerful tool inside your head to address crippling gestalted emotions like anger and sadness and fear and hurt and guilt and limiting beliefs about your worth and what you deserve and who you are and put them to rest so that you can get moving because I remember when I first started meditating back in high school it was like 30 seconds and then the brain just went into overclock and it was just impossible to to focus on a candle and stare at a flame for more than a minute and it wasn't until I, I went through the process of, of getting certified and learning about hypnosis and having someone work with me to release those crippling beliefs about myself that I, I was ashamed of who I was and that I didn't deserve to be anything more than that which I had already created and it was like it was life changing and, and I, I hope to share that with other people, you know? I like that. I like that a lot. We're all we're all on our journey, but some of us are a bit a bit further ahead than others. Yeah, and we should be uh, all of us reaching into ourselves and pulling up the best of ourselves. And if that means that we need someone to to reach down and, and pick us up, or or we are privileged enough to be able to reach out and help someone else up to the plateau that we're on, it, it's not that their plateau is worse than ours or that our plateau is better. It's just that there is more to life than your current situation and the more you experience and the more you shift your perspective and add to who you are uh, i i hate the term becoming but the more you're becoming the the more you can be but it, it's so true you know like we are all in this together and we make it so much worse than it has to be yeah that's definitely true why can't we all just Get along. <laughs> <laughs> I blame Facebook. Oh, we have to blame someone, right? I mean, there's always been something to blame. Before social media, people were blaming newspapers for taking away everybody's attention. And news is so bad. But I think it's easier to react to something that has no impact on your life than to actually take sober stock of who you are and your faults and, and make a plan to improve. That's why, I, that's why I put the blame on every single individual living on this planet. We can all do yeah. something to fix it. We all have that responsibility. And okay. it's, not, it's not to say that I'm my brother's keeper. It's to say that, you know, we're missing out on, on the extraordinary when we succumb to our own ego and, and get high and watch TV and eat Cheetos when we could be doing so much more. Agreed. Well, also in saying that, all the power to you, Pat, man. I hope you have great success with the life yeah. changes you're going through. Uh, congratulations on the work that you've done and that you're continuing to do, you know. Keep it up. Yeah, and uh, hopefully I can um, just keep you all up to date on how it goes. Yeah, for Heck sure. Heck yeah. Um, next week we're going to be recording a new Crime and Punishment video, Tuesday hopefully, and then Thursday Rugmo and I are going to do Atlas Shrugged. Yes, sir. So we can all look forward to those two videos coming out soon. And then wrapping up Atlas Shrugged, hopefully before the middle of August, because I am, I'm ready to put that one to rest, e even though it's going to suck to put it to rest. I wish there was another 3,000 pages. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to keep reading it. Keep reading it. <laughs> But then we'll be able to jump into the Divine Comedy, and you're joining us on that journey, right, Pat? Yep. Did you buy it? You already have it? Yeah, I bought it. Yes, right. Good. Beauty. On that note, uh, like, comment, subscribe. Check out the podcast and YouTube versions. we got a donation box if you're interested. And may the force be with you. Or equal to Mass Times Acceleration. <laughs>